All right, well, welcome, Embrace. Welcome to church today. Way to go. You made it. It's beautiful outside. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, Welcome to you at our network churches, one of our campuses, or if you're watching online, a special welcome to you. Thanks for being with us today. You guys could be doing a million different things on a beautiful day like today, and you chose to join us. Uh, We don't take that for granted, so thanks for being here. My name is Brian. I'm the campus pastor at our 57th Street campus, and we are in the middle of a series called Dumb Things Christians Say. Maybe my favorite title to a message series of all time, Dumb Things Christians Say. And last week, we heard from Travis Fink, our Sertoma campus pastor. He did a great job of reminding us of the common Christian encouragement that goes like this. You say, hey, God won't give you more than you can handle. And Travis did a great job of reminding us that God won't give us more than he can handle. So that was a great message. Before we jump into our content today, I want to sit in this idea of dumb things people say. Because I just like when I hear dumb things people say. I say dumb things a lot of times. We all say dumb things, not just Christians. So I asked a bunch of people on staff this week. I asked a bunch of my friends. I said, hey, what's the dumbest thing you've ever heard someone say? Some of it was really funny, some of it was pretty hurtful, but we're going to jump into it anyway. One of my buddies said his wife actually told him that she didn't marry him for his looks. That was a little mean, but not too bad. One of my buddies, he worked in retail back in the day, and over the Thanksgiving holiday and then going into Christmas, one of his coworkers said, man, isn't it crazy how Black Friday falls on actually on a Friday this year? And my buddy was like, no, no, not too, I could have seen that one coming. Another one of my friends, somebody asked them this question, do vegetarians eat olive oil? I don't, I actually don't know the answer to that one. I think they do. I'm not a vegetarian, but I assume they do. But rather than thinking about what are dumb things you've heard other people say, what are some of the dumbest things you've ever said? I've got two of them. The first one, a waitress brought me my meal one time and she said, enjoy your meal. And I replied, you too, but you're not eating, are you? Sorry about that. Just keep walking. I've also done this once or twice, I think only once. Hey, when's the baby due? There was no baby due. There was no baby due. Brian Rock did that. And here's what I want to do as Christians, as followers of Jesus. Can we just commit together to never ask when the babies do? Never. I don't care if your best friend, she just gained 35 pounds in nine months. You don't say anything until she brings it up. That's just what we're going to commit to today. But we say dumb things, right? We're also offended by dumb things. Is there anything ridiculous or silly that offends you? I'm actually super offended by people that say the word supposedly with a B instead of supposedly with a D. I don't know. Apparently, for the entire English language, I'm just really offended by that. But I think my, the thing that offends me the most, usually I love my phone and my computer. Modern technology is amazing most of the time. And you know what I love about modern technology? I love spell check. Spell check, I'm typing in a word and I'm not getting it right. And just gently my phone says, hey, Brian, that's not how you spell this word. You spell it like this. And I say, thank you, spell check. Thank you, modern technology. But I am so offended every time I type the word necessarily in and my phone's like, I got no clue. I don't know where you're trying to go with that. I type that word necessarily in and it looks like the word I'm trying to spell and my phone's just like, Move on. Start over. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> the point is we get offended by silly things and we say dumb, dumb things sometimes. But that's okay. I'm not sure, though, that we're actually offended by the thing that should offend us most. Today we're going to talk about a common Christian phrase that I've said hundreds of times. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say hundreds of times. And I think you've probably said it too, but here's the saying. Love the sinner, hate the sin. You might have said it on your way to church this morning as the kids were freaking out in the back of the minivan. Love the sinner, hate the sin, man. We always say this. This is something I've said consistently, and I want to try to talk through what I mean or what the heart of this saying is for me and for Christians. Generally, when we say love the sinner, hate the sin, we're actually trying to care for somebody or love somebody pretty well. When I say love the sinner, hate the sin, I'm trying to care for a person over here and separate from them an action that maybe I don't believe in or an action that I think might be wrong. But I actually want to care for them well. And the ultimate heart is so that I want to care for this person so that one day they might be open to hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe one day 
even open to following Jesus. But oftentimes when we say love the sinner, hate the sin, and we see somebody living in such a way that's different from us or we don't believe a certain thing that they're believing, we decide, okay, this offense, this sin can't be tolerated any longer. We decide this is the time we got to take a stand, love the sinner, hate the sin. We're going to yell towards that viewpoint and say, no, that is too far, too far gone. It's wrong. I'm going to take a stand. Well, for me, in my career, I've worked in churches most of the time. I've been in ministry, and in most of that time, I've led teams. I've led teams of volunteers. I've led teams of staff. And if you at work, maybe you lead a team, or at school you lead a team, maybe you're a coach, you just know if you're a leader of a team, you've been trained to do a couple things. One, you're kind of trained to inspire and motivate. You're trained to help resolve conflict on a team. You maybe uh, have been trained to kind of come up with ideas, problem solve. If your team's stuck on a problem, help come in and problem solve. That's just what we do as leaders, right? No matter what area we work in. Well, one Sunday morning, a volunteer came to me, and this was a volunteer who had been working through some pretty significant uh, kind of issues on their team. There was a lot of divide. People were kind of arguing on the team, and so we had worked through a lot of different things. And this volunteer came to me one Sunday morning, and very seriously said, Brian, uh, could I have a moment of your time? I, I need to talk to you about something. And I said, of course. And so at church, we walked to a different portion of the lobby where we wouldn't be overheard by people. And so on my way, as we're walking together, I'm thinking through in my head, okay, Brian, you're trained for this. If you need to offer wisdom, offer wisdom. If you need to be firm, be firm. If you need to be compassionate, be compassionate. Brian, you've been trained for this. You can do it. You've got it. Okay, so I'm pumping myself up. We get to that spot in the lobby. We bend our heads a little bit closer together, again, worried that this sensitive subject matter might be overheard. And the volunteer looks me straight in the eye and says, Brian, can I get you a breath mint? Because your breath is so bad. And I know you have so many conversations with people on Sunday. That was my response. I had nothing. My usually quick-witted, if I do say so myself, my usually quick-witted and sarcastic mind, I had no response. I bowed my head in defeat. I held out my hand. I took the breath mint, put it in my mouth, and fired that volunteer. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I didn't actually fire him. The moral of the story is I have no idea how my breath smells. And might I remind you, my breath comes out of my mouth an inch from my nose. And if I can be unaware of how my breath smells, what else am I unaware of? What else am I missing in my life that's right in front of my face? Is it possible that I'm unaware that I actually treat people really poorly? Is it possible that in my life, every week when I go to school, I act one way, and when I go to youth group on Wednesday, I act a completely different way? Do I even notice when I gossip about somebody who just got a divorce? Do those things even register in my mind? If I can be unaware of my own breath, what else am I missing about my life? So today, as we talk through this phrase, I want us to try to think differently about it. And I've got two ways for us to try to think differently about the phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin. And the first way is pretty obvious. It's actually in the original saying. What if instead of saying love the sinner, hate the sin, we just said love the sinner, period. What if we just said love the sinner? Actually, even better yet, strike that. What if we just said love people? What if we just loved people and we worried less about their sin? What if we just loved people? And in fact, that makes me think of a guy who was far more wise than me that said something very similar. His name's Jesus. And in the book of John, we find Jesus talking to the disciples. And as he's talking to the disciples, he starts this verse in John 13. He says, a new command I give you. And when Jesus said, a new command I give you, I guarantee you the disciples' ears perked up. Because these Jewish men, the Jewish nation, hadn't been given a new command in hundreds of years. But Jesus starts with, a new command I give you. 
Love one another, period. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. No qualifiers. Jesus didn't say, hey, if they go to church or synagogue, love them. Or if they treat you really well, if somebody treats you really well, love them. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus simply said, love one another as I have loved you. What if we just loved people and were far less offended by their choices? Pastor and author Scott Sauls talked in a recent blog post, he talked about the fact that we as Christians, by definition, carry certain convictions. As Christians, there are certain convictions in our life because of what we believe. We believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. With that conviction in mind, that convicts us to live in a certain way. Our belief that the Bible is God's word and is our manual for life, that convicts us to think about right and wrong a certain way. And I love what he says as he goes on. He says this, when people assume a different viewpoint than ours, we are never to hold them in contempt. Scorn and disdain and a chip on the shoulder are not Christian virtues. And so as Christians, armed with these convictions, every day we're going to run into people, every hour we're going to run into people that have completely different viewpoints than us. On everything, from money to marriage to politics, to sex, everything. And how do we treat people like that? And what Pastor Saul said is he goes, you are never to hold people in contempt. And how good is that? Never hold people in contempt. My fear is that in our zeal for these, convic these convictions, we've done exactly that. We've put ourselves at odds with other people. And we've taken a stand on certain sins or certain things that we don't believe in and we don't think the Bible teaches. And we've taken stand on those, on those issues and we've yelled at them because we're convicted by our beliefs. We think to do so, but nobody hears us yelling at those viewpoints. People only hear us yelling at them. And you might win the argument or you might get the last say on Facebook because people just decide to stop responding. To stop responding. But if you win the argument and you lose the person, likely you've lost. If you win the argument and lose the person, you've lost. Because nobody's ever yelled into loving Jesus. But plenty of people have been yelled out of loving him. Some of you know Chuck Smith. He works at our 57th Street campus here. And uh, Chuck is a, um, he's a gentle giant. One of the kindest people I've ever met. And I'm pretty sure that Chuck could just take me out with one swipe of his big paw. But he's a super nice guy. One of the kindest people I've ever met, like I said. And I was trying to find a way to jam this into the message. And I think I found a way. Last week I ran a half marathon. And so I was looking for a way to jam this into the message. I did it. Um, Thank you. I, okay, take it easy. I had to wait far longer for you guys to start clapping for that than I expected. <laughs> That's on you. So last Monday, after I had run the half marathon on Sunday, I wore my medal to work. Because I didn't want to boast about it through words. I thought I'd just let people see, hey, what's that medal around your neck there, Brian? Oh, this? Oh, well, let me tell you, I ran a half marathon yesterday. Uh, and so Chuck, during the day, he was just so kind about it. He's like, way to go, man. Super proud of you. That night when I, got home, uh, when I got home from work, there was a video on my phone that Chuck had sent me. And Chuck, uh, it was just of his face, and he was just congratulating me. He said, man, way to go. So proud of you. Well done doing that half marathon, man. Great job. And then he panned out, and he was wearing 10 medals for marathons he had run. <laughs> and Chuck goes... Man, that half marathon, Brian, you're so cute. Well done, buddy. <laughs> and so Chuck, he's good people, man. Good people. But he is legitimately one of the least offendable people I've ever met. As I've been around Chuck over this last year and gotten to know him, he is friends with everybody. Whether or not they believe like he does, does or live like he does, everybody that's around him just says, man, that guy, he cared for me. He, it was like I was the only person in the room when he was talking to me. And so I asked Chuck last week, I'm like, Chuck, how is it that you care for people so well? 
How is it that you do that? And this is what Chuck said. Jesus calls me to love others, and so I'm going to start there. That's it, period. Jesus calls me to love others, so I'm going to start there. What if we all started there? What if we all started there and we got a medal for loving people well and caring for people well? Let's just love people together. The second way I want us to start thinking differently about this phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin, is get rid of my own sin. Get rid of your own sin. How about that? Okay, nobody raise hands unless you really want to, but has anybody ever driven 10 to 20 miles over the speed limit, weaving in and out of traffic to get to an appointment on time? Anybody seen another driver do that and been super offended and annoyed that that person's driving like that? Anybody ever done the Brian Rock where somebody swings around to pass you and you speed up a little bit so they can't get in front of you? (laughs) Only me? My point is this. The mindset that we've created as Christians around this saying, love the sinner, hate the sin, is one that is very much focused on other people. It's very much focused on how others are living and not how I'm living. What if we gave more thought to how our brokenness was affecting the people around us? I think the thing that should actually offend us most is our own sin. And instead of being offended by the way the person next to me is living, what if I cared far more about how I was living? And this, I think, is an absolute truth in the Christian world today. We are very selective with which sins we decide to hate. I'm very selective with which sins we decide to hate, which I decide to hate. The crazy driver, they're a menace unless I'm the crazy driver trying to get to softball practice. I sure do hate it when somebody stabs me in the back, but if I do it, it's justified. I hate it when I see a parent humiliate their kid in front of people and yell at them in front of people. But I tell myself when I'm yelling at my own kids behind the closed doors of my own home, it's just making them tougher. And man, we hate sexual sin, don't we? but we give ourselves a lot of grace when we're looking at pictures on our phone or on our computer that we shouldn't be. So love the sinner, hate the sin. We don't actually mean it when it comes to us. Because we can always do this. We can always say, well, I'm not as bad as her, or I'm not as bad as that crazy driver, or I've stayed away from the big sins, unlike my neighbor back there. And we compare and we compare and we compare But the problem is God doesn't compare you to your neighbor. God doesn't compare you to to your spouse. God doesn't compare you to the addicted uncle. God compares you to himself. And here's the deal. You get zero cosmic points for being better than the person you're sitting next to. Zero cosmic points. That's not a thing because God compares you to himself. If you came on Easter, you heard Adam Weber, our lead pastor, talk about this verse from Romans, Romans 3, and it says this, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us, Brian Rock, Adam Weber, the Pope, everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. That's actually the point of Easter. The point of Jesus coming to earth is the fact that we didn't measure up. And if God's comparing you to himself and comparing me to himself, when he looks at us, he needed to see something different. He needed to see Jesus who sacrificed himself in your place. And so the entire point of the cross and the point of Jesus coming to this earth was for you to be compared well next to God. So even if the the worst sin we've ever committed is keeping that $20 bill bill instead of a $5 bill for change or the worst sin you've ever committed is talking back to your parents, then we come up short. You come up short. What if we were so offended by our own sin that we would attack it? What if we were so offended by our own sin that we'd rail against it? What if we were so offended by our own sin that we went on Facebook and told the world that we are sick of our vengeful thoughts? What if I took to Twitter 
and said, I am done with this quick temper. I can't stand it anymore. It's driving me crazy. What if the next time you go to the coffee shop with your friends and instead of getting off of your chest how much you hate Trump or how much you distrust the Democrats, you get off of your chest how much your sin is making you crazy? The fact that you hate how you treated your spouse last night. How about we get that off of our chests? And if we hated our own sin like we hate other people's sin, what could God do with that? If in the place of the time that we spent being offended by other people's sin, we ask God to open our eyes to what's in our own life that offends him, what could he do with that? So love the sinner, hate the sin? How about this? How about we change the phrase entirely and we create a new Christian rallying cry and we go after this like never before and the new Christian rallying cry is love the sinner, hate your own sin. Love the sinner, hate your own sin. And in a world today where the word hate is about as bad as it gets, we reserve that word for the very worst of the worst. In our society today, the word hate, we do not use that word lightly. But man, do we need to hate sin. We should hate sin with a capital H, hate sin, because this is what sin does. It rips apart families. It breaks trust. It buries friendships. It causes death, whether spiritual or otherwise. That's what sin does, and we should hate it. But what if the skeptical, a skeptical world saw us battling our own sin? What if a skeptical world saw Christians fighting their own entitlement and their own anger and their own pride? How much more attracted would they be to Christians and to Christ then than they are today? Remember, the genuine idea of the phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin, is to care for people, right? Like we want to care for people over here, not agree with necessarily the action over here. And the heart behind doing that is so that they might be open to hearing the gospel someday. And the hope behind that is that they actually might follow Jesus someday. That's why we say it. I think that's why we actually, what we actually mean by it, what we're trying to accomplish. And if we loved the sinner and hated our own sin, I think we'd actually accomplish that. And as I close, I want to make sure that you heard me correctly. I said, hate your sin, not hate yourself. Hate your sin, not hate yourself. You need to understand, I need to understand every day when I wake up that I am loved by the king of the universe, the one that made the stars, the one that knew me in my mother's womb, that knit me together. The one that did that, the king of the universe, he loves me. And he proved it through his son, on the cross. We can never forget that. If we forget that, we spiral into self-loathing and self-doubt, and that's not what we're talking about today. God loves you, yes. God hates sin, yes. So love the sinner, hate the sin. Love people like God loves people. Get rid of your own sin and worry far less about what that person next to you is doing. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you that you are a God who loves us so much that you sent your only son to die for us on the cross. God, would we be reminded today that as you walked to that cross, our names were on your mind. As you took those nails, you thought of us. God, would we be reminded that the maker of the stars loves us. And God, would you bring to our mind those things in our lives that offend you, our own things. 
Would you bring to our mind the things that need to be cleaned up and thrown in the trash so that we might follow you more closely, so that we might love people really well, so that people could look at us and say, that's what a follower of Jesus looks like, somebody who loves people and fights their own brokenness. God, would you help us do that today? We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.